things that scripture calls us to do as pastors uh, is to pray uh, for you guys. And I hope that that's a mutual activity that you're praying for us. And uh, one of the things that I get to hear, along with uh, other things in the lives of my fellow pastors, is I get to sit and hear them pray for you. Uh, and uh, I think that one of the things that God does, because this is what the Spirit does, you know the Spirit's at work when your affection for fellow believers grows, because that's what the Spirit wants to do. The Spirit is trying to unite us together. He's already put us together, and now He's trying to enable us to go more deeply into the possibilities that our relationship holds for us. And so I always enjoy hearing Pastor Steve pray uh, for you by name, uh, for your kids, uh, for the issues going on in your lives, and just know that we hold you up in that. And so I always appreciate uh, Steve and Emily and his family. So thankful for them and their commitment to Christ, uh, their desire to serve him. Uh, I I love them uh, in so many different ways, and many of you who have been around here for a while have seen God uh, take them through a time of severe mercy, a time of real difficulty and pain and suffering. Uh, And we have been privileged to to walk alongside of them as they've walked through a very dark valley as a family and and leaned in on the Lord to trust him. So very thankful for them, so very thankful for their family and pray for their kids uh, and so grateful for them. Well, today I want to talk to you about the practices of the church. And so, let's see here, did I? Oh, here it is. I always forget my little helper here. I want to talk to you about the practices of the church and just remind you where we are. And this term, I I know I say this every week, but I don't want you to forget that ecclesiology is really what the scriptures teach about the ecclesia, the church, the assembly of God's people that are people that God brings to himself, right? So these are people that, that, that God has worked by his spirit in everyone who's a member of the body of Christ to make them aware that they were a rebel, that they needed Christ. And so the Spirit was at work when you heard the good news preached, and the good news was that God, the Creator, right, had conspired together with His Son to come and go after rebels, and Jesus came to the earth to live a sinless life and to go up onto a cross to take onto himself what we deserve, the punishment for our sin. He took that into ourselves and to himself, and then he rose from the grave to win for us what we had lost. And when we believe in him, that good news, that he came for us to do that, he changes us and makes us new, and he brings us back under his loving, benevolent rule. He, he writes us with regards to who we are and what we're called to be. And so we're his people. And he didn't just bring me individually to him, but he brought me to you together and you to me. So we're his people. And he's doing this uh, among men and women. He's doing this among among black and white people, among people from Asian descent and and, uh, uh, Slavic descent. He's doing it from all types of people around the world, and he's gathering them together as his people. And he wants to manifest his reality in the way this group of people love him, serve him, and love each other. Right? So the church, right? The doctrine of the church, what the scripture has to say about the church. And so we've walked through some of these uh, uh, lessons and we talked about, well, who is the church? Well, the church is everyone, scripturally speaking, from the time of Christ's ascension to the time of his return who's believed on Jesus Christ, the good news. And they constitute the church, right? What's the purpose of the church? The purpose of the church is to be God's redemptive agents in the world, right? We're to reflect the reality of what God does in salvation by the way we live individually and by the way we live corporately, and we're to go out and proclaim that the king has come and the king has opened a way into the kingdom for rebels, and if you believe on the king, you'll know blessing and salvation, but the king is returning, and if you don't turn to the king, there'll be judgment, right? So the people of God, we come together to declare that as the purpose, and also we come to demonstrate that this new reality is something different because it's only Christ who has the power to take people who are enemies across ethnic uh, lines or across socioeconomic lines or across gender lines. It's God who has the power to break down the hostilities to bring those people into a kind of relationship that you can't explain how they exist together, how they love each other except for positing Jesus, right? John chapter 17. And then we talk about who makes up the church, the members, right? The people who have believed in Christ who come into the church and they come into the church through a public ceremony so that the church can affirm their relationship with Christ 
and the church publicly commits to their discipleship. And as the member comes in, they commit to use their gifts and to submit to the church as God's given authority, and they come also to contribute to the church and to be accountable for the people who are there. And we're going to dig into a little bit more of that. Then we talked about the leaders. The leaders are responsible to imitate Christ and lead the congregation to imitate Christ, right, through word and through their lives. So that's where we've been. Now I want to talk to you about the practices of the church. What does a church do? Okay. Now against the backdrop of the kind of way we do church in the West in particular, I'm going to draw on a whole bunch of biblical word pictures or metaphors to try to describe the church. And one of the ways, if you look at the church in the West, in America in particular, right, you think about the city of Xenia, there are dozens, literally dozens of churches. And what often happens is that people come into a town or a region where we are right now, and they look at the churches the way uh, we look at, uh, we won't do this much anymore, now we have to do it online. We used to walk into a mall and choose between, you know, a number of different so- uh, stores. Well, I think malls are headed on the way out, it looks like right now. Uh, I even heard one of, the, one of our sister churches is getting ready to take over the Elder Beerman store in Fairfield Commons to hold church on Sunday since there's no uh, 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 Elder Beermans anymore in that building. So I think it's a good use of the Elder Beerman space myself, but... Uh, that's not what they intended. Well, it used to be we'd walk into a mall and you would walk up and down the mall and you would go to your favorite providers of goods and you would shop here because you like their product or you would shop here because you like their prices or you shopped here because these clothes always fit you, right? And you went into these kinds of things and you shopped in here, but you didn't have any allegiance to those places. You didn't view the staff in there as family. You didn't walk in there and say, hey, brother salesperson, right? You didn't say that. Uh, you walked in, and, and they, you were a customer, and they, they helped you. And matter of fact, you judged the quality of, your, of their service based on how they helped you. You didn't have any responsibilities when you walked in the door. You didn't clean up the floor. You didn't adjust the, 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 uh, the, the merchandise on the shelves. You weren't any of that kind of thing like that because you were a customer. And so many people have come to view the church as that's exactly what the church is. It's a religious provider. It provides religious goods. And I want to shop here. I kind of like... I liked it one Sunday, I don't know if every Sunday, I like the person who preaches, or I like the programs that they offer, or I like the facilities, or I like the, the, the things that come along with this, the contacts, the people who are here, right, all kinds of jokes about people coming to the church, you know, it's a good place to find a spouse, you come to the church because it's a good place to make good business connections, you know, so it's an important social gathering. So a lot of people have viewed that, and then they come in and shop, and then as soon as this church stops providing the product that they want, then all of a sudden, okay, I'm out the door and I'm going to go next door. As a matter of fact, there's 30 other church providers that are right here in the area, right? So that if you would take among believers, even in our little area, let alone other areas, if you could take, you know, one of those old maps where you would start off with a, with a piece of yarn and a pen and you'd start off at a manual and then you would follow that person's path to another church and then put a piece of yarn and then follow them three years later to the next church and a piece of yarn and follow that and, then, and eventually it'd sort of look like the phone lines. It'd be so confusing, right? Because people have a short life because it's not a family they're committed to. They're not ripping themselves out from a body that they're organically attached to They're not leaving a family that they belong to. They're just there, and it's a good lecture hall or a good provider, right? So what we're trying to come back to is we're trying to come back to the biblical vision of what a church is. And my basic underlying point of this whole message today is for God to use his picture of the church to reinvigorate our belief in the mechanism, in the the, the institution that he has set up for our growth, our blessing, our protection, and our effectiveness in ministry. And it's a vision of the church where people know one another, they're connected to one another, they're invested in each other, they're accountable for each other. It's not any place where you hang on the edges. It's not any place where you keep yourself disentangled from the lives of the people. It's not some place where you sit on the outside as a spectator and you don't participate. The vision of the church is where everybody's all in. It's all messy. We're all leaning in on Jesus. We're holding each other's brokenness. We're enjoying each other's successes. And daggone it, we're in it. And we're trusting God that to hang in with this group of people, to go after them, that's where life, purpose, meaning, protection is found. Okay? That's a different vision than often what we think of with church. It's even gotten more a little bit denigrated. 
or, or kind of disintegrated in the moment where now that we have so many, especially in the West, where we're so, we have an embarrassment of riches, the fact that now I can get almost any preacher on a podcast, I can get almost any service online, I can almost get anything. It's even encouraged other people to think, well, then I can just shop right from home. I can just shop right from home. I can interact with people via media. So the whole call of Hebrews to gather together sounds like, yes, let's all get in front of our computer screens or our phone screens, right, and meet together in the Lord. So I want to talk to you about that. Now, I'm going to use this picture, right? I'm emoji rich today, just so you know. Emoji rich today. I'm going to try to explain these to you. And if you've got notes today, two things I would encourage you to do, okay? The, the ability to copy this little diagram. It's going to be up here at least twice, but I want to encourage you because I'm going to walk you through this diagram to talk about what the church is. And if you want to draw a circle on your, on your paper and start to put these little things down, I'm going to put words for each one of those emojis, right? There's actually a meaning behind them. I'm not going to leave them oblique there for you to try to figure out about what's going on. But I want to talk to you about the practices of the church. I'm going to come back after we walk through this. I'm going to walk through three important things. We've already talked about membership, but I'm going to briefly address uh, communion, briefly address baptism, and then I'm going to address in more detail the issue of discipline. Okay? So I'm going to talk about those, about what the church does. Okay? What the church does. And as we look through what the church does, you can't come away from the church and say, it's a lecture hall. You can't come away from the church and say, you know, it's just a gathering of, of casual acquaintances. You can't come away and say, well, it's, a, it's a place where you find good business contacts, right? There's nothing like that that's a vision of the church, right? It's a place where people are in each other's lives because they believe in Jesus and they love each other deeply and they want to be agents to further what God wants to do in each other's lives, okay? So that's the idea here. Now, let me just start here, right at the top. We'll work our way around. And I think, do I have a, I don't know if I have a, a little uh, thing. Do I have, ah, oh, here we go. I can use a little laser. All right, so I'm going to start right here. I'm going to start right here with membership, okay? So one of the things is, is that the church is welcoming people in. And I want you to notice here that the people are shaking hands. What they're welcoming people in to is a partnership, Okay? If you want to read about this, you can put down Philippians chapter 1. We're partners together in the gospel. Philippians 1, 3, 4, and 5. So I'm, when, when a person's coming to Emmanuel, I'm not welcoming you in as a customer into a store. I'm welcoming you in as a brother or sister in Christ that you're going to come and get your hands dirty and throw in because we're partners together in the same mission. So you're coming in, and I'm saying, welcome, partner. Not, I'm glad to have you, customer. Let's see if we can please you. Now I'm welcoming you, partner. Come on. We've got gifts from the Lord. We've got a call upon our lives. And I'm leaning in on you. You're going to lean on me. We're in, in it, right? So it's a partnership, right? A partnership is a sharing in common. To be partners in the gospel says that we're both equally believers in the gospel. So I've participated in it by believing on Jesus Christ. The reason I'm here is because I believe on Jesus Christ that he died for me, that he was raised from the dead, and that everything that I need is in him. Well, that's why I'm here. And you're here for the same reason. And we want to make sure that you know him. And then once you come in and we've affirmed that, well, then we're saying, come in, partner with us. That's why when you come in, you're looking for, as a partner, you're not looking to be catered to, you're looking to find a place to partner, to get busy, to serve, right? To love, to engage, right? So we're welcoming people into a partnership to try to further God's saving purposes among us. Well, what does he want to do? He wants to take every person who's a follower of Jesus and grow your relationship with Christ so that he'll be more sufficient, he'll be, he'll be more uh, awe-inspiring, he'll be more worthy of your obedience, he'll be someone that you trust deeply, he'll be someone that tells you who you are and you trust him to tell you who you are instead of the social media or the world outside. You trust him, his voice dominates your life. It shapes the way you parent, it shapes the way you love your husband and wife, it shapes the way that you think about yourself as a high school student. It shapes the way you spend time before the computer. It shapes the way you use your, your money in your pocket. It shapes everything, right? So we're coming, let's partner together, and that's what we want to do. We want Jesus to be Lord over every square inch. We want him to dominate every passion and priority in my soul, right? 
So we're, let's partner together. So the very first thing. Then the second thing here is what we did today, and David and crew was leading us, right? We come into worship, well, worship hands, right? Come into worship. Some of you, your worship hands are down here, right? But worship hands, right? If you have them or you, wherever you put them, right? We worship to the Lord, and we come into worship. One of the things about praise, right, is what we do is the people of God should be people who regularly take each other to look up. And the reason we look up is we look up to be reminded of who God is so that we can put ourselves in the right place, right? We put him in the right place so that we can be put in the right place. And one of the biggest things you need every week is to be reminded that your God is big enough to handle the problems that you're carrying in here every week, that your God is big enough to trust him to follow his path, to be faithful to your marriage, that this God is big enough for you to trust him to go to school and identify openly with him. That's that, that, that's that, that God. He loves you that deeply. He's that powerful. And matter of fact, he's a God that you can take a deep sigh today because all the really scary things that threaten you, he's taking care of. Now, I don't know where you are, but all the bad things are gone. Okay? So you may be in one of those moments. I was praying with Ron when we came out this morning. I'm in one of those moments where we don't have in the immediate sense any heavy hard things hanging over us. We've had those. A darkness in our family, a physical illness, things here. Yesterday we were here crying and weeping together with our sister Kim over the death of her son, Kentrell. Thank God by his grace he rescued Kentrell in the latter part of his life and he came to believe in Jesus Christ so that we could, we could mourn him with hope yesterday. And God bless Pastor Will, who gave the gospel to about 300 people, 200, 300 people who were here yesterday, and God took us into that. I don't, I'm not sitting with my, my sister Kim today with that same thing over me today. So some of you are there. I'm in one of these moments where the, an immediate around me, there's not something big hanging over, right? But even in those moments where something difficult is happening, you stand under the umbrella of a God who has rescued you in Christ that nothing can separate you from his love. And he's taking care of the only thing that really threatens you is to have the God of the universe over against you. Right? He's taking care of that because he has righted us with, with him, with the Father, so that now he looks on us and says, there's my son, there's my daughter, you come here. Right? So the idea here, we come to worship. Then, of course, as we're doing here, we're going to talk about, we come to uh, read the scriptures, right? To hear Jesus' voice the resurrected Christ speaking to us through his authorized representatives to tell us who we are, what matters, what we're supposed to be up to, how we should live in our relationships, what it actually means to love our neighbor. He actually makes us want to love our neighbor. But we teach his word, and so everything is centered on that. So wherever you find the people of God together, they're not looking everywhere else to get guidance for their life. You'll find brothers standing alongside of each other saying, let's think about this from God's perspective. What's his heart and mind on this? How should you respond as a husband if you're supposed to love your wife to Christ? If you're supposed to love her as Christ, are you doing that? I don't care what your unsaved buddies at work are telling you. I don't care what they're telling you. Don't put up with that. You need to kick her to the curb. No, what does Jesus say to you? What has he empowered you to do? Well, here it says in Ephesians 5 that you're supposed to love her the way Christ loves the church. That's what your call is today, with the power of Christ, right? So we go to the Word of God to shape who we are. Then here, this little emoji here, right, is the idea that you should have a sense that people here are loving the people who are here, right? I'm not here because of a duty. This is what Pastor Steve was talking about. I know I'm coming here. Sometimes I come here because I know it's right for me and my heart's not in it. But I know that ultimately what God wants me to do is to be one who comes here with a sense of anticipation because I love Jesus, Right? We all know doing the right thing in a relationship because we know it's the right thing, even though our heart's not in it. Right? Husbands, wives, parents, okay? sometimes children. You're doing the right thing because you know it's the right thing to do, but inwardly you're angry with the person, inwardly you're disobedient, inwardly you're this kind of thing. Right? Well, okay, good. I'm glad you're not heading the other direction, but no wife wants her husband loving her because it's his duty to do so. Right? There's my duty today. I thought that was your wife. No, that's my duty right there. He's my duty right there. There's my kids. They're my duty today. Well, I mean, that's, that just draws you in affection to people, right, when they say that. 
So Christ is trying to move us to the point where we're people who love him, and the consequence of loving Jesus is it makes you love other people. Because when you become like him, you love people. And so when you find here, you should find people who are disposed. When Darcy comes in the door, I should be motivated by trying to love her to Jesus. Right? Madison comes in the door, should be to love her to Jesus. Not to use her, not to avoid her, not to do any of those kinds of things. No, my, my job is to love her to Jesus because I love Christ and Christ makes me love people. Okay? And then the idea of prayer. You should find a group of people who are praying for you here. Right? Now we, we've talked about this here and we instituted maybe a couple years ago. You can, and I really would encourage you if you don't have one, we, we put out a, 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 a little, bull, a little uh, booklet where we put people's names in there that are members of the church so that we can pray for one another. And I, and I will just tell you that Ron and I, when we pray by name for people, which we do, we pray for many of you throughout this week, as we pray for you by name, it draws our hearts into your life. It draws our hearts into your life. We pray for your kids. We pray for your spiritual growth. We pray for, for people to put their feet feet down on the path of Christ and choose him and not turn back. We, we pray for you by name. We call out to God on your behalf. Why? Because we love you and we want you to live in a way that honors Christ. Right? There should be people. You don't pray for everybody in every church. Just like in my family, it's my first priority to pray for my family. I'm the dad and, and God forgive me if I don't pray for my kids and my wife. That's my responsibility to hold them up to the Lord but also you're my church family. I don't pray for every church the way I pray. I don't know everybody in the other churches the way I know you. And so it encourages me to get to know you. It encourages me to reach out and say how things are going. It encourages me to come and follow up on a prayer request, right? So you guys know that when you put down those prayer requests on Sunday, they come into us as elders, and we pray through those every week. I can list them off to you. We pray through those every week. Because we need God's help for the challenges that are in front of us. Everything that truly happens in this church that matters is supernatural. For people to grow in Christ is supernatural. People can organize an event and get people in the door. That's not supernatural. But for people to grow in their love of Christ, that's supernatural. For husbands to re-engage in their marriages over against the odds, that's supernatural. For, for people to turn their lives over to Christ and bow the knee to them, that's supernatural. For people to lay down their anger and to come and apologize and restore a relationship, that's supernatural. For somebody to want to step across socioeconomic boundaries when things are so complicated and they said, I'm just going to plow in here and trust the Lord, that's supernatural. That's not what human beings do, right? And we need help to do that. And then we'll skip the bottom one here about this one. We'll come back to that. And then also it's a place where we should be, a place where people are, are encouraging one another, right? Where you're affirming each other, where you're coming in. Uh, there's a little, you know, we watch a lot of uh, uh, home remake shows, okay? So this one loves home re remake shows. And I watch them with her. I enjoy them for the most part too, even though sometimes I'm wondering what kind of project she is now dreaming up given what we just watched, Right? But we're watching them, and one of these is a little show, this is not an advertisement, it's a couple down in the south who are trying to work in their own little hometown to rehab it, okay? And, um, and, and, the, and the, the guy in the relationship, his name is Ben, is such a genuine, kind, sweethearted man, he just brags on his wife all the time. He just brags on her all the time. He made a little quote one time, he says, I think if, if we spent a little bit more time bragging on people, the world would be a better place. Right? And I, I just thought it ought to be the case where you could get together in the body of Christ and when you hear somebody's name coming up, you hear Pat Dunstan. I, just, I was celebrating just yesterday as we were driving home from Pastor Steve's birthday, just talking about uh, how Pat is just quiet, steady, rooted spiritually and how God has used her sometimes in crucial moments in our church to speak a word of wisdom that came out, and some of you who were there, you know what I'm talking about, and God just used it in the moment just to powerfully penetrate what was going on, and I'm just so thankful for a woman that's so rooted in faith, so trusting in him, and really holding on to the truth in the midst of a time when the church was in trouble. And those are things that we ought to celebrate with each other. We're all good at picking the things about each other we don't like. We don't need any help about that. 
Right? Just, we're naturally Yelp-oriented, right? We just want to go, uh, two stars, two stars, you know, and it's a rare one to give a five star, okay? But what would it be like if the people in your life are regularly walking up to you and they do it right next to you and I get David right next to me and I said, you know, the one thing I appreciate about David, right, Nykirk right here, is that David, he's just genuinely honest and a teachable young man, right? I can say that I'm an old man, right? He's a young man. And he's just a teachable young man. He's, he's open to having input in his life, and he comes to me and asks questions, right? I know a lot of arrogant young men. I know a lot of arrogant old men, okay? I appreciate that about him. Now, I need to be the one that's encouraging him in the path because you know what makes a person humble? You know what makes a person open? Jesus does that. And I'm giving thanks to Jesus for what he's doing, right? Right? So we need to be that thing. And then over here are gift givers, right? So not Christmas gifts here, but this is the idea that when, a, when, a, when you walk into the church, what you find is a whole bunch of people that their mentality is, I'm a giver. You know why? Because I've been given. Okay? Now look, look at Romans 12 with me for a moment. I'm going to dip into this one here before I get into the other passages. But Romans 12, come to this with me here. And uh, we read this in our membership class this week. And uh, it just made me think about it this morning. Notice in in chapter 12, which is the lifestyle that follows giving your whole life to Christ, a living sacrifice, okay? Then he says, well, this is the kind of person you would be then if you come to church, okay, in the body of Christ. Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. For by the grace given you, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment and in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now here he's not saying, don't don't come in and think you're you're a loser, right? He's not talking about that. He's saying, you need to have a a Christ-centered view of who you are, that you're a person who's been rescued, you're a son or daughter of God, and, and you have been given resources to plow into this body for its benefit. And so you not only need to think rightly about yourself, not that you're a loser, but also that you're not more highly, that you're a person who's growing and on the way. You haven't arrived, that's, so you're humble. You recognize I need to be taught, and it's probably very likely if somebody gets to know me, they're going to have to correct me because there's broken stuff in my life. That's an accurate assessment of yourself. But at the same time, you're over here saying, I've got gifts to give today, and so I'm moving in as a producer, a giver, not a receiver, right, primarily. And so this is what he says. For just as each of us has, uh, has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. And then he goes on to say, if you have a gift, use it. If you have a gift, use it. Whatever it is, use it, right? So if you think about here we're coming in the body of Christ and I'm, uh, it's a giving and receiving is happening all the time. So somebody's giving me exhortation and I'm receiving it. Somebody's reaching out to help me when I'm low and I'm, I'm taking a hand and le- letting them pull me up. Somebody's speaking the truth of Scripture to me and I'm listening to it, right? Sometimes they speak the truth of Scripture to me in the life that they live without necessarily speaking it. But we're giving to each other. So we're in that kind of thing. And then the, the one here with the guy with the arrow up here is the idea here is that you should find here, and I want you to put a passage with this one if you're looking for one. Put Philippians chapter 3, okay? Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17. Philippians 3 and verse 17. Paul says the church ought to be a place where you find models to follow. So in verse 17, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live like we do. Okay? Now, this ought to be the case. And so notice, there's a humility behind this whole thing. When I'm walking in, I'm assuming, right, that God is at work in people's lives, and I'm assuming when I see Chris Robin and get to know him as I watch his life, that God's going to teach me through his life. And one of the things that God has taught me through Chris Robin is he has wrestled with adversity in his life and and stayed and hung in with the Lord and and leaned in on him, right, through some difficult moments, right? 
And I'm learning from his experience. I find other people, Galen Smith is one of my dads in the faith. And Galen has taught me to pray in many ways. He's encouraged me in difficult times. I've gone to him for wisdom at at crucial moments in my life, right? Because I look up to him as one of my VIPs, my very important people, my mentors. I want to follow him, okay? So those kinds of things happen all the time, but I'm expecting to find some of you have helped me to parent and you've never taught me, but I just watched you parent, right? And we've all taught people not how to parent, right? We've all taught people that, we know that, but we've encouraged each other in terms of, okay, that, that's a good idea. I, I like that. I love that relationship they have with each other. Man, I'd love to be able to talk to my teenage daughter like that or my teenage son. I, I, I need some wisdom on that. And humility will tell me that I need to learn. And we've all been in a place as parents where sometimes your kids' ears have shut themselves off from you. Right? And you can say the right thing as many times, but for whatever reason, there's some kind of brokenness in there. And we're all crying out, God, please take one of my brothers and sisters and give them a platform to say what the, my son or daughter needs to hear so that they can hear from you. And I don't care who gets the credit. I just love my kid and I want them to hear it. Right? So you should be able to follow models here. And I'll tell you this in, in particular, even though I, I work in a place where uh, all are told there's a, a high predominance of, of kids who come from intact homes compared to the secular culture, right? There are many women who need to see in the church a healthy, God honoring, safe man. And there are many men who need to see a woman who loves the Lord and respects men and lives in relationship with them that's healthy and good. And they need to see that because it's very hard to find it in our secular culture. Right? We need that. So you ought to be able to come in and find models. And that also makes it for me, right, when I walk in, is you guys know this, even though we don't like to think about it, there are eyes on you. You think about that? There are eyes on you. And this is not calling us to be phony, right? One of the ways you can respond to this is, well, okay, we'll be phony. I'll put a plastic smile on my face every time because Christians always have it together. No, it's not being phony. One of the things that people need to see you do is they need to see you work through adversity and be honest about it and struggle through it with them and apologize to the people you hurt and do those things because that's what a Christian does. And a Christian isn't a Pollyanna fake person. They need you to be honest. They need you to ask for prayer. Everyone in here needs prayer. If you're always the person who's always praying for everyone else and nobody's praying for you, something's wrong. Think about that. Nobody's praying for you. It's like, well, you don't need prayer and nobody knows what's going on in your life. No, no, you need prayer. You need prayer as much as I need prayer, right? So the issue here is we should find models of people. There are people in here that have a prayer life that we need to know. There are people in here that understand how to, how to parent their kids in a way that we, we, we've got a brokenness because of our family in the past or our own past history. We need somebody to help us with that, right? We need a new vision of our marriage because we can't figure out what it is. We need help from each other, right? And God save us as parents, right? We use our kids as the extension of our identity and the extension of our worth, which is, is horrible because it's not loving to our kids. Right? And so we're protecting our reputation and sometimes keeping our brothers and sisters away from us to speak honestly to us about our kids because we care more about our looks or our reputation than we care about the health of our kids. And so somebody in the nursery can't come to us and tell us about the behavior of our child without us getting mad at our nursery worker. Right? Or we won't ask for help because we're ashamed and we don't want people to know that we're not a perfect parent. Well, let me just tell you, we all know you're not a perfect parent, okay? We all know we're not perfect parents. There are no perfect parents, right? So the issue here is we should find models, and of course that means that you got eyes on you. People are watching your marriage. They're watching young people, how you behave in relationship to your parents. Some of your friends that look to you as a leader in the pack, They're looking to you for cues on how to behave in relationship to the authority figures in your life, your parents and your school teachers and those kinds. And when you're cynical and you mock them and you work around them, you're just encouraging them down the same old dead path. Because they got their eyes on you. They're watching you, right? We all know there's parents. Our kids watch us, and we we tell them only watch the good things, but it never works, right? It never works. Okay, 
So let's go to this next thing here. Real quick comments about these, and then we'll land on one for five minutes. Okay, communion. Okay, when we come together, we teach on this every month. This is the reason why I'm, I'm not belaboring it here. But here, in obedience to Christ, believers regularly celebrate the new covenant blessings. Now, if you want to look at the new covenant blessings, it's the promise Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant blessings are that God cleanses and forgives those who believe in Jesus. He cleanses and forgives them. He gives them the Holy Spirit so that he changes them from the heart. He makes them new. Okay? That's the new covenant blessings from Jeremiah 31. It's Jesus, through his life and death, he gives those. And so we come to commemorate and celebrate those blessings. Right? Those are the greatest blessings of all blessings. That's a greater blessing than having all of, of uh, Jeff Bezos' wealth. That's, that's, that's a greater blessing than having the most powerful position. It's a greater blessing than having, you know, 10 gazillion people follow you on your Instagram account to enjoy the inanities of your life, right? It, it's, more, it's more important than having that group of friends at school think you're cool. It's more important than your colleagues at work thinking that you're bright or smart, it's more important, that's the blessing that you have. We come to commemorate that and celebrate it in a meal, and then we come by doing that, when we do celebrate it, we reaffirm our identity. I'm, I'm, a, I'm one who is the child of God. I've been saved by him. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of who I am, right, what matters, and of our mission. So this is why the whole thing is we're, we're going to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So every time I take that communion, I'm saying I believe in Jesus, Every time I take that communion, I'm saying the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is what is necessary to save anyone. I'm celebrating the fact that I've been cleansed and forgiven. I've been given the Holy Spirit and called into a mission. He's making me new, and I've got all the potential today to do everything that he's called me to do. I'm celebrating that every day, and I belong to this group of people. They're my people. Okay? So communion, reaffirming that. And then baptism, Right? Believers here are willingly, gladly baptized in obedience to Christ. The baptism symbolizes what Christ has done for them in their death, right? So if you see someone baptized here, right, you're going to see some buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection, okay? And I underline the word believers because you will never see in our church, and this will be another message down the road, you will never see in our church any babies baptized because in Scripture, Baptism only occurs after someone believes, okay? And so baptism is not something that affects the one being baptized by virtue of someone else's faith. It's picturing what someone themselves have done in reference to Christ. Okay? And we'll talk more about that in detail. So we baptize believers' baptism. And so here it publicly declares, so it's the sign, if you will, okay? It's the Christian tattoo, Right? The Christian tattoo is baptism. It's the public sign of your identity with Christ, and you're showing that by identifying the fact you get a benefit from his death, so you go down into the water in the death, and everything that Jesus did when he died, he took your sin on him, he satisfied the curse that was rightfully yours, you get in the benefit of that, that he satisfied that and removed that from you, and then you come up out of the water to celebrate the fact that you've been made a new creation. Okay? I identify with him. Right? And so Jesus said, wherever you go, one of the marks of my disciples is you will baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Why do we baptize? In obedience to Christ to publicly declare the reality of what has happened to us when we believed on him. Okay? Now, last thing here. Okay? A people that discipline each other out of love. Okay? I'm going to read you three passages. And I want to draw some points together on this one. This one, if you haven't squirmed yet this morning, will make you squirm, okay? Uh, one of the things, uh, and again, you know, doing the right thing, okay, all the old people in here, me included, doing the right thing, you know that the right thing is not the easy thing often, okay? We all know that. Doing the right thing is not the easy thing. 
And so what Jesus calls us is it's kind of love that he wants us to have from one another that if Matt sees me losing my mind, walking away from my identity in Christ, that Matt loves me enough that he's willing to go past the awkwardness, the uncomfortableness, to go after me and say, Greg, I love you too much to let you walk off from Jesus. He can't let me drift off. He can't close his eyes to it. He can't harden his heart and then kick me out the door. No, he's got to go after me. So here's passages. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore the person gently, watching out for yourself, right? So those who live in the Spirit are are basically those who are walking in faithful relationship with the Lord. They're not a spiritual SWAT SWAT team, right? We've got the, where's the spiritual people over here? Oh, there, there, it's the SWAT team right over here. Somebody's in trouble, we call up the SWAT team and they go over, right? And they get little shirts that say hashtag spiritual people on them, no. No, they're just followers of Jesus who are walking with the Spirit, and when they see somebody who's walking away because they know where the Spirit leads, they're concerned, right? This one here. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone, right? What I want you to get from this one is how persistent this is. The person will not let them go because they want to make sure, number one, that the person really is in trouble, and once they do make sure that they're in trouble, they want to keep pressing to that person to turn around. The goal of of pursuing someone who's caught in sin is never to remove them, it's to restore them, to reclaim them, to grow them. Right? So if you sin against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone, right? Deal with it on the level of it. But if he doesn't listen, then you go grab two brothers and sisters. And here you're not bringing them as your advocates, you're bringing them as people to listen in on your conversation with your brother or sister to see if indeed you got it right. And if you don't, got it, you don't have it right, they may testify against you and say, the real problem is with you, brother, not him. But their job is to listen in, and if they agree with you that sin is on the table, then they become a group that's appealing to that brother or sister, please, please return. But then if he refuses to listen, then you tell it to the church. Because we as a church are concerned that this will impact the whole body. This this affects our witness for Christ. One of our brothers or sisters is in desperate difficulty. It's our concern. I can't shut it off and say, you know, can't your small group take care of that? Right? Now, this last one from 1 Corinthians 5. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole dough? Right? God wants us to be people who are sincere in our commitment. We're not a bunch of phonies who talk about following Jesus and then ignore the fact that brother so-and-so and and sister so-and-so are living over against exactly what God calls them to be. And he says, but now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral, greedy, an adulterer, a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. And again, Paul's thought there is not that it's about sharing some casual meal. It's saying of embracing them as a brother and sister in Christ and actually by that embrace, affirming their behavior is consistent with their identity in Christ. Okay? So here, let me talk about this. What is it? And here, if you want to write something down, I would encourage you to write something down here. Okay? One, brothers and sisters pursue Christ on their own so that they will not be stumbling block to their brothers and sisters. And so that they will be spiritually prepared to encourage and protect them. This is why you who are spiritual, well, it assumes that people are pursuing Christ on their own so that when I walk in, right, and I'm pursuing God's vision for my marriage. This has happened in EBC uh, a, a long time ago. but It's happened in EBC where I've had women come up to me and say, Greg, the way my sister is behaving in relationship to that man she's not married to, I'm really, really worried about that. And my first comeback to them was, have you talked to her? And the answer was, yes, I have. And I've talked to her repeatedly. And I've appealed to her repeatedly that this is inappropriate. Did that woman that was coming to me have some sort of joy? Was she some holier-than-thou person? No, she was brokenhearted, and she was weeping over the fact that she was concerned about what was happening to two married families in our church and to their children brokenhearted, had done everything that she could, felt that she needed to come to me to add me as a witness in the event. Okay? 
So brothers and sisters want to nurture and protect each other spiritually, and brothers and sisters pay attention to each other spiritually, right? This means that there's a quality of conversation. If I'm talking to Chris Freed or Ryan Freed, and I'm talking the only thing I ever talk to Ryan about is mushrooms, right? Right? Because Ryan eats an ungodly amount of mushrooms and finds all kinds of strange mushrooms, right? If all I ever talk to Ryan about is mushrooms, well, God forgive me because he is not my mushroom brother, right? He's my brother in Christ, right? Men, if we only talk to each other about our jobs, if you only talk to each other about your sports, if you only talk, and you don't talk about your relationship with Jesus Christ, you are abrogating your responsibility as brothers in Christ. I say that to you sisters as well, right? We're looking out for each other, right? Brothers and sisters believe Christ that to sanction sin is to dishonor him. It's to hate your brother and sister and to endanger the health of the body altogether, okay? We're people that we believe Christ. We believe that the biggest threat to a person's life is walking away from Jesus. You believe that? That's the biggest threat to their life is to walk away from Jesus. It's not really a lost job. It's not even really a bad diagnosis. It's not, it's not even a difficulty at work. It's, it's walking away from Jesus. That's the biggest threat. Brothers and sisters want each other's best more than they want comfort or ease for themselves. Right, you got to say this to yourself. No, if there's a person in here that enjoys confrontation, there's something wrong in your soul. Okay? And if, if you're like most people and you know you've got a confrontation coming up, you do it because you know it's right and love demands it, but you, you wake up and you've got a lump in your throat and the weight's on you and you're worried about what's going to happen to the relationship after you have the confrontation, right? all those kind of things like that, but you love people enough that you do it. Okay? And then brothers and sisters don't look for sin, but they're not naive. And they're not surprised when they see a brother or sister fall into sin, right? And this is why if you're growing in Christ, one thing that you should be aware of is that you're a sinner and that you're struggling with sin. And so when you see it in someone else, you shouldn't go like, oh, I thought they were a Christian, right? Well, God says that to you every day. Oh, I thought you were a Christian, okay? Oh, I thought you were a Christian, right? God doesn't say that, right? So I, I repent every day. I confess every day. I, I pray confession with my wife when I go for ways that I've treated her. Okay? Every day. Right? Brothers and sisters will say something if they see something that dishonors Christ. You'll say something. Right? And this is where one of our things is we like to be the... Did you see that? No, I didn't see that. Right? Because I don't want responsibility for that. Did you see that? Well, good. You take a responsibility for it. Okay? And then brothers and sisters are always motivated by love so that they confront for the purposes of growth and restoration. It's never about trying to get rid of someone. It's never trying to about punish someone. It's never trying to assert that you're better than them. In, in, the, in the Christian life, every time you talk to someone, it should be true of you that you're so aware of the grace of God that you're leaning in on him to give you the strength to do it because you know but for the grace of God, there go me. Okay? I don't come to you, if I ever come to a brother or sister or my wife or my kids, I never come to them as someone who's not known sin. I never come to them as someone who doesn't understand uh, giving rein to my evil desires. I'm not, I'm, I know a person, I know that from the inside out. And I come to them out of fear and longing, and they can turn right back on me and say, well, who are you to say that? And my response to them is going to say, you're exactly right. I'm broken. I've got all kinds of things, Right? But if all of us had to be cleaned up perfectly to speak to either, each other, we'd never speak. We wouldn't do it. So we're all broken people helping each other. And then brothers and sisters are in it for the long haul. The, in Galatians 6, you restore such a one. There's a naivete sometimes that we have. There are in this room and in our lives addictions that there is no quick fix for. And some of you will get impatient because you don't deal with what the other person deals with. You're going to say, I thought we talked about that, right? How many parents have said that to your kids? I thought we talked about that. I thought we went over that before. I thought we told you to pick this up. And why is it it's always laying here? I thought we talked about that. I thought we said, how many, how many husbands and wives have been saying, how many times have I told him, right? Like since from the moment we were married, all those kind of, and if you don't think that deep, deep change is going to take time, then you don't understand your own brokenness, right? And so we get frustrated, oh, I tried that once, that's it. No, no, it's in the long haul. And then finally, brothers and sisters are willing to follow Christ 
only and all the way if love demands that they part from one living in open, unrepentant sin. Okay? I put that there because anytime that happens, as a church, and my heart is broken deeply, there are people that I weep over on a regular basis because I yearn for them to return to Jesus. No joy, no triumphalism. That's just not how love behaves. Okay? Now, I want to end today, and I want to, I want to do a classic pastor move here, right? The old, one of the old classic things was to end with a little bit of poetry. Okay? So I've not got poetry, but I have a, I have a, uh, a song. And I just think... My goal is to try to impress you with God's vision for his people, okay? And this song is one of the richest portrayals of God's vision for his church. So let me just share this with you here, okay? It's my thing here. Now, you know this song, The Church is One Foundation? The church is one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and by word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one or all the earth, her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth, one holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food, and to one hope she presses with every grace endued. Though with a scornful wonder men see her sore oppressed, by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed, yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes up how long, and soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Now get this, these last couple verses. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with the vision glorious her longing eyes are blessed and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Yet she on earth hath union with God, the three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O happy ones and holy Lord, give us grace that we, like them, the meek and lowly, on high may dwell with thee. Right? May God let our vision of the church climb past the petty things that cloud your vision for why you, you won't engage or won't talk or won't give in yourself. God is calling us to a depth of connection to one another, a depth of commitment to each other. He's challenging us to reorder our priorities, to put this group of people at a different place in our lives to open our lives to each other. And I'm speaking to many of you that are doing that and doing it well, and I'm speaking to all of us in terms that the depth of knowing and connection that God's calling us to, we have yet to know. May God enable us to get past the pettiness to get down to business, right? Pray with me and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, this is a breathtaking vision. Uh, Lord, for some, Lord, it's just a scary one. Lord, to step out in obedience, to be known by other people, that's scary, number one. And Lord, we do know that, Lord, because we're all on the way people, that people will hurt us. We know that we hurt people. And Lord, it's by faith, because of who you are and what you've done, that we believe you to continue to keep pressing forward toward each other. Lord, deepen our bonds with each other. Lord, strengthen the ties that bind us in the Spirit. Lord, increase our faith. Lord, empower our obedience. Lord, may it be true that, Lord, you can't explain EBC. You can't explain this body apart from positing people's deep faith and trust and love for you. Lord, the only reason why we're going to step into the lives of each other, the only reason why we're going to open up our lives, the only reason why we're going to step outside and talk to other people who need to hear about Jesus is because you have changed us and we love you, Lord, and we trust you. Lord, grow us, we pray. Bless those that are listening online, Lord, today who couldn't be with us. Encourage and bless them. Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters here. Lord, we cry out you to get together. Lord, please provide for us, protect us. Lord, teach us. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.
Amen. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming today. Have a great day. Talk to somebody on the way out. Start, start applying right away. Get to know someone. Pray for someone. Share a prayer request. Get engaged today. God bless you. Have a great day.